Thank you for inviting me today. I love, love, love being with students. And I especially love being with students from BYU. I got my undergraduate at BYU. I got my MBA at BYU. My son's at BYU. I'm determined to help BYU continue to do a great job of making sure students have wonderful opportunities, internships. I have 30 interns in my company, quite a few from BYU. And congratulations, you will have a wonderful career because uh, the education that you got with BYU, at BYU should give you lots of reasons to be successful. Um, I've prepared, I've kind of over-prepared today, so while I don't actually need these notes, I want to make sure I get the really good stories out, so I don't want to forget them. But I was asked to share with you kind of my perspective um, from my role in the company. So what's unique about me is that there aren't very many female CEOs of technology companies fast-growing technology companies, and there are even fewer in Utah. Um, it's unusual for a marketing person to become a CEO, and um, there really is nothing special about me other than I'm a person of tremendous faith who feels like I'm one of the most blessed humans on the planet, and I'm really not afraid of anything. So and you'll kind of get some of that today. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Merit CX. Merit CX is probably the biggest company that you know nothing about. It's uh, roughly 175, 200 million in revenue, headquartered in Utah. Um, we have offices all over the world, 19 offices. We have about 2,000 employees, 900 are full-time employees, and the other are part-time. We call them casual workers. I wish I was a casual worker. It's being such a hard worker. I just want to be a casual worker. Um, the company is a culmination, a marriage of two companies, Allegiance, that was a um, technology company started by Adam Edmonds, who graduated from the Mac program. And he had a job at KPMG, but the first day on the job, he didn't show up. He's like, no, I really want to start a company. Because he met Larry H. Miller, who said, if you want to be an entrepreneur, don't do it while you have a house payment. Do it before you get a big house payment. So he had a house payment, but he sold his house and his wife's car and all their furniture to start Allegiance. Uh, he's still with the company. And then the marriage of Allegiance with a company called Merit's Market Research. It's part of a uh, family business, $1.8 billion family business, and this was the research arm. So put the two companies together. We build customer experience programs. So if you don't know what that means, it means companies should do a better job taking care of you because they have all the information about you. So think about your cell phone provider. They can find your cell phone when you can't, right? When you walk into the store, they're like, uh, yeah, what's your number? And they know everything about you. They know what you buy. They know where you are. But yet, they don't do a great job. So we help companies do a better job of taking care of their customers because life's too short for really crummy customer experience. And so we help them use their data to look for patterns in the data and take care of you. And yes, headquartered in Utah. So when they bought the company, we said, we want to move the headquarters here. And they're like, Utah's kind of a backwater, isn't it? And I'm like, no, it's not. Really smart, hardworking people there. Um, uh, my father was a, a brigade commander, combat heavy brigade commander. That will explain a lot about me. So I'm the oldest child, and he was tough. So we traveled the world. We learned that uh, nothing is hard. And um, he had more female company commanders than any other commander in the Army. And I'm like, Dad, why do you have so many female company commanders? He's like, well, they're smart, they're good, they're fair, they're tough. They just happen to be women. So um, that's how I was raised. Um, I'm a student at heart, love learning. I'm a self-healing person. Um, and I'm one of those people that believes that impossible is an opinion, not a fact. And so you kind of see that in my career. Uh, it's never worked for me to be anything other than who I am, and it's never worked for me not to follow my gut. So let me just kind of take you through um, what's worked. I have a few slides and some stories to tell you, things that are, I don't think are unique to me, but they're things that if you hear me talk and you see me talk, these are common themes that I have when I, when I work with students. So I just actually presented to um, the interns in our company, and then some of these things I talked to them about, and they're writing everything down. I'm like, dudes, don't write everything down. Just the things that make sense to you, maybe think of one or two, but the rest, think about how you live and the things that you want to do and things that are important for you. So the first thing is embrace disruption. Too many times we try to run away from things that change, things that are different for us. 
I have a, two sons, 21-year-old son who's a student at BYU studying applied physics and neuroscience. He wants to be a doctor. I'd like him to go in the MBA program. We're still negotiating terms on that. Uh, but he's a brilliant human. And I have another son who's an eighth grader, he's 13, also a brilliant human, probably going to be an engineer. But he doesn't like change. He doesn't want anything to change. So he won't wear anything the first time. You see a problem with this as a 13-year-old boy who wants to wear the exact same thing. So I have seriously bought the same pair of tennis shoes for the last 12 years, just different sizes. He just he doesn't want anything to change. And so we're working with him what it means to be resilient. But I'm like, buddy, there's only one thing that doesn't change. And it's that things are going to change. So, it's, so we work through this with him. So many times I see people run away from really hard things. So if you think about the hardest person to work with at your office, you should go work with them, right? Because you're going to learn things from them. The hardest customer, you should sign up for that customer. Nobody wants that customer. Give me that customer. The hardest project, give me that project. Because too many people will run away, run away from it. In my career, there was a woman in our organization who was awful. She was awful. And it was a great job working for her. And I remember thinking, I don't want to I don't, I don't, I don't work for her. But I really wanted that job. So I, I applied. I was the only one who applied. I got the job. So it wasn't because I was that good. It was because <laughs> nobody else wanted to work for her. And she was awful. But I learned so many things from her. I learned things not to do. I learned things to do. And I learned why she was so awful. She had a really hard life. And so I, 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 I tell people, Embrace, like move toward the disruption. Don't run away from it. Because you will learn more from hard things. I was just talking with David. Where's David? David has hard things. He's a young man. Hard things. And when I listened to him, how he's embraced it, the one thing I wanted to know from him this morning, David, what did I ask you? What'd you learn? What'd you learn? Because he did really hard things. And I want to know from him because he taught me this morning. He taught me what he learned. And so I put that into my, because I'm a student, I put that into, OK, what can I do better? What can I do different? Every single one of you is going to have really hard things. Every single one of you is going to have something, that disruption, that, that totally rocks your world. Embrace it. Take it head on. Don't be afraid to take things head on because you will grow. And you need to get to the point where you say to yourself, when you look yourself in the mirror, nothing is hard for me. Because if you believe that nothing is hard for you, guess what? Nothing's hard for you. Nothing's hard for you. Anything that hits you, you're like, nothing's hard for me. I don't know the answer yet. I don't know what I have to do. But since nothing is hard for me, I can do this. I can navigate this. I can bounce back. I can be resilient. I can survive this. Because guess what? Nothing should be hard for us. The way we were trained, what we know about this gospel, about this earth, nothing should be hard for us. So get, develop the lens where nothing is hard for you. Nothing's hard for David, right? He's learned some tough things. I've had things in my career. You're going to have disruptions. Don't be surprised when they show up. Oh my gosh, this is a disruption. This is terrible. No, embrace it. Be like, I've been waiting for you. Let's go, right? How am I going to solve this? So in my life, they told me, you're never going to have any children. You're never going to have any children. As someone who grew up in this faith, that's like a death sentence. That's like you're a pariah, right? Guess what? It's impossible to have children. That was someone's opinion. I have two children. Gave birth to both of them. No drugs, I might add. That's how tough. Two kids, they were wrong. They were wrong because nothing's hard for me. Lost my job when I was at Novell. I'd been at Novell for 14 and a half years. Loved my time there. I would have never left. But guess what? They had an acquisition. They had new management. They didn't get me. They wanted me everything to Boston. Lost my job. Was that awful? It wasn't the worst thing. I had no debt. I had all these skills that I had learned there. And once I figured out that it was a gift, because losing that job was a springboard for me to go and do things that I had no idea that I was capable of. I was diagnosed with cancer just four years ago. No cancer in my family. No, I, I've never taken anything stronger than a Motrin into this body. I don't even drink soda. I don't even have caffeine. There's no cancer. People in my family die from old age. 
or someone murders them because they can't stand them anymore. <laughs> they don't die from cancer. When they're like, you have cancer, I'm like, no, I don't. That's a mistake. Let's, let's check again. You have ovarian cancer, a very aggressive form of ovarian cancer. You're 48 years old. You have a 20% survival rate. And no one survives this. So get your life in order. I was like, well, that is a crummy lottery. But guess what? For those of you that listen to any of the talks, uh, Jess has heard a couple of my talks. It was a gift for me. Because not only did I take it head on, because that really is the only alternative you have. You can curl up in a ball and sob uncontrollably, but that will not get you what you want. So I said to my husband, this kind of sucks. Because I wasn't going to, I didn't want to be that one that died early, right? But I guess I don't have to worry about food storage anymore. And <laughs> I don't have to take care of my parents. And you're going to have to clean out the garage and the basement. And someone's going to have to bury you. I mean, like all these things. But hey, how about we fight this? How about we embrace this? And I even gave a talk a long time ago about how I use my MBA to beat cancer. Because if you think about your MBA, your MBA is really for you to manage the business of your life, right? So if you keep it in a box, well, I'll just use it at work, you missed it. The MBA really is for you to manage the business of your life. So how about supply chain? in getting all the materials I needed to, to beat my cancer. Oh, and I didn't lose my hair because that was a whole other story. And I had to negotiate terms to get frozen cold caps from the UK over here with Huntsman, who didn't want to mess with it because our job is to make sure that you live, not worry about your stupid hair. And how about we worry about the patient instead of, you know, like all this stuff. You got to be able to navigate all that. You got to be able to negotiate that. I would negotiate terms with my insurance company. They're like, we're not going to pay for that drug. It's 20 grand a, a pop. Oh, they paid for it. Oh, well, by the way, I had two cancers. I had cancer in my appendix. So you don't qualify for this trial drug. I used my MBA to get me through that. So thank goodness I had a great education. And thank goodness I had the confidence to kind of push through it. So through, did 18 months of chemo, survived, didn't lose my hair. Still have two more years before I get the big remission speech. But guess what? My doctors are like, she is crazy because she just embraced that cancer head on. She said, my one doctor, oh, so I had a surgeon and an oncologist, both from Huntsman Cancer, love Huntsman Cancer. They said, we've never seen anyone like you who just said, OK, 20% survival rate, let's go, people. Our goal, be part of the 20% or the new 21. What do we got to do to get there, right? And they were just kind of like my specialists that were awesome. I built a team, and they were the two I chose to be on that team. And I still, I love these guys. So I'll be walking the Salt Lake Half Marathon on the 16th of August, uh, 16th of April. I've done it every year except for the year that I had my hardest chemo. And one of my doctors flies down from Portland, Oregon to do the race with me every year. And so through this process, I got some great friends. So don't be afraid to use your MBA, but don't be afraid to embrace the problems, every problem that you have, because guess what? Nothing special about you. We're all going to have problems. Learn the language of standing up. We don't stand up. People are a bunch of chickens. So if you're the one person that stands up all the time, guess what? You're in charge. You get to be the leader. Too many of us let other people put us in a box. There are too many bullies. There are too many people that are not right. And as a culture, as a Utah culture, as an LDS culture, as a female culture, we don't stand up. It's really unusual to have people stand up. I'm surprised how many times people don't stand up for the right thing, stand up for their program, stand up for their team, stand up. So you need to learn the language of standing up. So I never say you're wrong, but I do say you might not be right. <laughs> I never say you're wrong, but I say I'm not convinced. What that says is you need to convince me, because I'm not going to give you my support until you convince me. I say things like, you might be mistaken. Would you consider this alternative? So I have a language of pushing through problems. And I never give up. Too many people are afraid. So uh, a situation happened yesterday. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm totally going to tell these guys. <laughs> I'm working on a big project, big project. Lots of money involved, lots of characters involved, lots of egos involved, lots of people with different positions. We've hired an outside party to help navigate some of these challenges. So we identified a problem 
and took it to the other party. So think of the other side of the table. And it exposed a weakness on their side, which they're not super happy about. So whenever you expose a weakness of someone, I promise you it's not going to go well. But in, we need to be able to speak truth to get this thing done right. So um, exposed the problem, didn't go well. So now this third party is supposed to help get this fixed. So we gave the fix to the third party and said, look, here's a moderator. You need to make sure you're and represent this information. He's like, this is perfect. But I don't really want to stand up to this guy who's super scary. I'm thinking to myself, I'm paying you millions of dollars. And you're a big fat chicken. So I wrote the, like, the talk track for this guy. And I thought to myself, this guy's a senior guy. I thought, you know, it's even hard for people who you think should be good at this to be able to stand up to bullies and to tough people. But this will, you can still be afraid. You can still be terrified, but just be like, fake it till you believe it. Just go and push against it. You have to not be afraid. It gives you a lot of power. It gives you, it gives you the ability to get the right thing done. I talked on the phone this morning on my way in to one of my colleagues who's like, this is rough. It looks like we're going to get what we wanted and expose this other problem and actually move the project down the road. He's like, this is so hard. I'm like, if it was easy, everyone could do it, by the way. Oh, and by the way, our job is to get this done. It doesn't matter how hard it is. And it's a good thing that nothing's hard for us. And he's like, yeah, nothing's hard for you, but it's hard for the rest of us. It's like, guys, you've got to keep pushing. I try to teach my children this because it's not, it's not natural in young people to be able to stand up. And a lot of times young people are afraid to stand up to adults because adults are always right. Doctors are always right. Professionals are always right. It's not the case. Imagine how strong our community is. Imagine how strong our families are. Imagine how strong we are if we can all have the language of standing up and where we can create an environment where it's safe for people to stand up, where it's safe for people to raise their hand. So as the leader of the company, as the CEO of the company, I look for ways to make sure that I can get the voices to speak up. Because our two cultures of our two companies that are now one, very different. The Utah organization, these are young tech folks who are used to having a voice. And my uh, market research folks, 140-year-old company, researchers want everything to be perfect. They don't ever speak up because their organization was very command and control, and no one ever listened to them. So trying to get them to speak up. I feel like a failure because they're not all speaking up. So I sent out an email. Uh, I write a blog in the company. And I said, let's just reset everyone. If I'm in a meeting and you don't speak up, I assume you disagree. And people were like, no, no, I don't assume that. I assume you disagree. So I'm going to pull you out to understand what your opinion is. Are you supporting this? Do you have ideas for ways? It's really uncomfortable for these folks. So we're kind of pushing through the discomfort because the product will be better in the end as people start to feel comfortable about speaking up. And don't be afraid for conflict. Conflict is an important part of getting things done. It doesn't mean you have to murder anyone, but it means that you need to embrace conflict to try to get to a resolution. Because if there's no conflict, it doesn't mean you've done a great job. You need to mine for conflict. Because too many times, the conflict doesn't get aired until much later. And as a CEO, it doesn't usually come to me. Like Everybody tells me what they think I should hear. It usually happens down at the <coughs> lower end of the organization, your individual contributors, your frontline guys. So if you sense something, you got to go and mine for it. you got to dig it up. Now, one of the, some, some of the CEOs I work with, they said, look, I love students from Brigham Young University because they can always pass a background check. They're hard workers. But my concern is that they don't speak up. And they let people, students, other employees who are not as smart and not as capable, but who will crawl over dead bodies to get things. And they'll lie and cheat and steal. And they let those guys win. So I'm on my own personal mission to try to get my friends from Brigham Young University, my students, to speak up, to not be afraid to push against the bully, to not be afraid to maybe elbow a bit to get in there. Because we should be Christ-like, absolutely. But we should also be peaceful warriors. We should not be afraid to stand up to people. Um, I have a funny story that I tell. It wasn't funny at the time. Um, uh, one of my bosses, very powerful wealthy, in charge, owns everything, who uses the F word with reckless abandon. Noun, verb, adjective, superlative. 
And it, for me, that's an uncomfortable word because I just flinch every time I hear it. And it's not because I'm such a prude, but I just, I'm just not used to that word. So we're in a meeting, all of his executives, all a bunch of uh, folks who had been there for like 40 years, a lot of old white guys, it's great. And then my team, super young, super afraid sometimes, me in this meeting. And we're in an all-day meeting. And it's just, it's just, it's just constant. So it, I didn't even think about it. It was just a reflex. I put my hand on his arm. I'm like, hey, is there any way we could use that word with less frequency, just less? just less. And I'm like, I know you went to a really good school, but just is there a way? And my team were like under the table. <laughs> They're like, it's not going to go well for her. And we don't want any part of it. And his team, mouth wide open. Does she not know who he is? Does she not know that she is a girl who works for him? I mean, it's just like, I didn't know my place. And he turned to me, stunned. He's like, is that word offensive to you? I'm like, yeah, it is. But I realized this is your place. This is your house. This is your company. And we're in your conference room. So I totally get it. I totally get it. But just for me, I just need you to hear from me that that word makes me uncomfortable. So if we could just use it less. He goes, are you going to report me to HR? I'm like, no, I just told you. Like, I don't need to go tell them because I told you. What you do with it is your thing. And he's like, and so I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to get fired. But hey, you know what? I got good skills, so I could get another job. But this is, you know, this was not okay. And I would want my children to stand up to people. So he said, I apologize. I am terribly sorry. I will make an effort not to say that word in front of you. So it's been years now, and he really tries not to say that word. And when it comes out, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I didn't mean it. And I'm like, it's all good, right? So I didn't make it a big thing. I didn't make it a big production. But it was something that was important to me. And so for, for me, it's always about integrity. If I feel a certain way and I'm not going to say something, it's like I'm going to get a nosebleed if I don't say something. And my team later, they're like, have you lost your mind? Like, why you got to do that? I said, guys, it's not OK. And they said to me, it's already hard to be a girl doing what you do. You just set yourself apart as being this problem. I'm like, no. What I said to him and what he understands now is if I have a problem, he's going to hear it from me. I'm not going to go to HR. He's going to hear it from me. And he and I have that relationship. He'll say, look, I need you to do this. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's a dumb idea. And let me tell you why. Listen to me convince you why. And so by the end of it, he's like, OK, that's a dumb idea. He listens to me, and he and I have that relationship. I'm not filtered by all these other folks who are like, oh, that was inappropriate. And I was like, hey, you know what? This is what I do. OK. But we don't stand up enough. OK? We don't stand up enough. I, however, stand up all the time, and I get in trouble for it. So in ward council, when I say, yeah, the young women are not going to be setting up chairs for the, the ward, like the young, that's a young men's responsibility. They're like, oh, there she goes, standing up again. OK. Um, this picture cracks me up um, because you should really never wear a yellow gingham shirt to work. <laughs> this guy somehow pulls it off. Sounds cliche. Attitude is everything. Guess what it is? It matters how you project yourself. Happiness is a choice. Guess what? Be happy. People have hard things all the time. No one likes to be with people that are Eeyore. Right? And everybody has bad days, but I can t look across the topography of my organization and tell you who are the happy people and who are the unhappy people. And I tell you, if I'm stuck in an elevator, I don't want to be with the unhappy people. I want to be with the happy people, right? the people that are always positive. My son went on a mission to Taiwan. I was worried because here's this bright, capable boy who took four years of Chinese, whose Chinese was spectacular. Who's, who, he won the state science fair at 15. He's, he's, this, he's going to be an amazing doctor someday. Not super social, no interest in driving, doesn't really talk to people. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's gone on a mission for two years. Guess what? You have to talk to people for two years. And I was worried about his roommates, like his companions. Like it's just, if he doesn't like someone, it's like it's not going to go well for them. So because I taught him how to stand up. So uh, when he was set apart in his blessing, they, uh, he was blessed to remember that people are attracted to cheerful people. And I was hurrying, taking notes when they blessed him. And I was like, I circled that. And when, when the blessing was done and we were catching up with my son, he's like, Mom, I'm like, 
I know, people are attracted to cheerful people. That was totally for you. He's like, I know, because I'm not a cheerful person. I'm like, you need to be cheerful, and you need to decide today to love your companions. And guess what he did? He decided before he went to the MTC that he was going to love every companion. And he had great relationships with his companions, because he's no picnic to live with either. But he embraced the concept that people are attracted to cheerful people. When you make assignments, you're going to give it to the people that you know are going to get it done, the people that are positive. Your customers are going to gravitate toward cheerful people. Your customers are going to be with people that they like. Our company has a great product, but guess what? My competitors have great products too. But my customers tell me, you know, your product's good and the competitors, whatever, but we like your people a lot better. And if we're going to write a $20 million check, we just want to be with people we like. We don't want to be with any dirt bags. We just, we like your people. They help, they're helpful. I'm like, well, they're from Utah, right? This is how we work here. We were like a beehive. It's like the beehive stayed. <laughs> They're like, you guys got something going on in Utah. We don't know what it is. I'm like, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. (laughs) Get negative people out of your life. Guess what? The worst kind of employee is an employee who does terrific work, but is an awful human. That's the worst kind of employee. Because if you have a person that does terrible work and is an awful human, you're like, out, get rid of them, right? But if you have an employee who's doing a great job, but everyone's thinking of ways to kill them, It's the worst kind of employee because you get stuck and you're just like, I can't get rid of them because they're doing a really good job, but everybody hates them and no one respects them. Get those people out of the organization. You'll be more innovative. People, it'll be free to get things done. And those people, I've worked really hard to get them out of the organization. It's hard to get them out of the organization. It's really hard. And when they leave, guess what? The, The organization survives and you find good people. But if you have people on your team that are miserable all the time, I would go up to them and say, you know what, Lincoln freed the slaves. Y'all need to go, right? Because we're going to have a culture here of people who can do and people who are happy. Uh, If you ever want a great book, uh, Sean Aker, The Happiness Advantage. I met him a few years ago. He's a Harvard researcher. And it's research about happiness. Uh, My son, who uh, just broke up with someone, I bought that book for him. He's like, really, mother? The Happiness Advantage. I'm like, buddy, happiness is a choice. And as someone who has beat cancer so far, guess what? Happiness is a choice. Because every, I did weekly chemo, I did 18 months of chemo, and every time I went into the um, infusion room, which is this beautiful two-story look over the valley, Huntsman does such a great job, there were people in there who were terminal, who were happy, who were spreading happiness throughout the chemo room. Be a doer. Be known for getting things done. Be that guy that always gets things done. When the management says, oh, we don't know who to give this to, but we're going to give it to this guy because he always gets it done, be that guy. Because there's so many people who are not doers. And speed matters. It matters to get things done on time. It doesn't have to be perfect. Here's my gift to you. Learn to live by the law of good enough when it matters. Okay? So when I fly, I fly a lot. I want the pilot to be perfect. But the person that cleans the seat, don't care if it's good enough. All right? If we can get out on time. My hospital room, I want the doctor and the surgeon to be perfect. But the person that takes all the junk out of me, I don't care. Good enough. It's fine. Right? Makes my bed good enough. Learn to live by the law of good enough. Perfectionism is a suicide because you, you will never get it done. And most people don't care. Get it done where it's sometimes good enough as long as it gets done. I tell my team I'd rather have it done than perfect because speed matters in my industry. Um, but be known as that guy. I have a guy in my organization, his name is Troy. If I have a problem and I don't know what I'm going to do, I call Troy. I say, Troy, I need you to do it. And he's like, got it. Because you know what he says to me? Buddy, nothing's hard for me. And I'm like, you're my people. We can get things done. When I had uh, one of my executives left, and I'm like, I know who I'm going to put in that job. I put Troy in that job. So when I present to the board, I'm like, I'm going to give it to Troy. And they're like, perfect. It wasn't even a discussion. Because he's known for getting things done. Be that guy. And then this is something really important to me. We have the ability to lift as we rise in our careers and our personal life, every one of us. And we don't think about it enough. But we can identify those people who lift us. And no matter where you are, no matter how low your day is, no matter what happens, we have the ability to lift others, to smile, to look people in the eye, to help them. The two sons that I have have been raised to understand that their job is to lift other people, no matter what, no matter what. 
And so I have a lot of proud mom moments. We were on a flight coming home from Hawaii. My younger son, Davis, who's a survivor of a set of triplets, he's this lovely, lovely human. This woman was struggling to get on the plane. I'm sitting by the window. I'm not even paying attention. He throws down his stuff. He gets up. He hurries. He's like, please let me take that for you. Where are you sitting? Let, let me, I've got it. I've got it. Here, take my, my arm. I'm thinking to myself, you're not going to get down that aisle that way, but OK. So he takes the stuff to her seat. She has a cane, puts it in the overhead bin, puts, and he says, if you need something on the flight, you just say my name, and I'll come get it. So he comes and sits down. You can't make a big deal with my kids because they're like, enough. But I'm like, hey, buddy, super proud of you. The flight attendant comes over to me later, and she's like, Mrs. Clark, your 17-year-old son, so impressed with him. I'm like, yeah, he's 12, by the way. He's a giant, but he's 12. <laughs> she's like, how did he, did you tell him? I said, no, I don't have to, because these boys have learned that this is what they do. She's like, we don't see that anymore. Super proud of this boy. He's going to be a great missionary. He's going to be a great father. He's going to be a great husband because he knows what it means to lift other people, even when you don't feel like it. I saw this every day in the cancer center, every day. People lifting, people caring, because we have the ability to do that, and we have the responsibility to do that. And as you become more senior in your roles, it's going to be more important to do that, because people don't do that. People don't think about that. We are so blessed to be here at this time. We have so many skills. We're people of tremendous faith. We just forget to use it sometimes. When I was at Symantec, the chairman of Symantec said to me, there's something about you guys from Utah. I don't know what it is. You always know the right thing to do. You're humble, but you're so smart, and you're capable, and you're kind. What is it? I'm like, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. He's like, it's like you're Amish, but you dress better. <laughs> So my charge to you today is be those people. Be those people that people recognize you, that you stand out. Because you do have the ability to make a huge difference in your organizations, in your families, in your communities. So I'm happy to take questions from you guys. And you can come over here, or you can just, or let's make him run around. No questions too hard. Remember, nothing's hard for me. OK, so I'm going to embarrass you here for a second. So 30% of the women in our class Kareen was a big reason why we're here in this program. So um, I know some of the people on our board. So I've been following her career for the last, how long have you been? When did you join Allegiance? I learned uh, January 2013. OK, so it's been about this little over three mm -hmm. years. So I've been following her career right as she joined Allegiance. And so I asked one of her board members to send me a little note about Kareen, because I've been watching it from the board side. And so this is what um, Spence said. So he said, first, I think it's important to note that our pursuit of Kareen to come to run our company had nothing to do with her gender and everything to do with the talent executive she was at the time. We needed someone that could handle a founder transition with grace and style while raising money, hiring a team, and growing a company. She fit the bill really well. One of the key signs of a good leadership for a CEO is the ability to get um, other talented executives to come work and work with them. I emphasize with them because that is the way Kareen leads. She has been able to recruit, without a headhunter, a terrific team that both respects and likes her at the same time. They are as invested in her success as she is in theirs. In the meantime, she was able to work with the founder, make him an integral and critical part of the team, and build his leadership skills. In my career as a VC, I have never seen a founder transition go this well. Thank you. That's So I'd uh, love to hear more about that. Well, so thank you. That's a nice uh, note from one of my crazy board members. So um, <laughs> he is really lovely. Uh, also a member of the church. Um, when, uh, when, I, when I was at Symantec, it was when I got cancer. And when I finished my first six months of treatment, I'm like, I don't love this like I used to. So when you have cancer, you decide, I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do anymore. So I said, I'm not going to do this. So I worked on my uh, separation from the company. It took me a long time. But Spencer and uh, the founder of the company, who was Adam Edmonds, he had been for two plus years, I need you to come help me run the company. And I'm like, no, I'm a really big deal. And you're a little tiny company. And you're like a founder guy. Like, he wears shower shoes, but he doesn't shower. You know, he's just like super Google-ish on this stuff. So um, when the board said, we want you to come and be this, you know, come and take this job, I was like, no, you know, it was just a little tiny tech company. And um, 
they said, look, we have this founder. He's been here forever, and we just we need to make some changes. So I was really worried about the founder because it's his company, right? It's his company. Guess what? It's still his company. So when I got in there and I said, look, buddy, uh, this is how I roll, and I need you to be really successful, but I'm not going to fight with you on stuff. So you have to promise me there's no light between us. So when I make a decision, when you make a decision, when we make a decision, you can't change it. You can't be all, oh, well, I'm really the founder guy. Because I will fire you. Because I'm not, I, I don't have time, because I almost died, so I got stuff to do. So he said, okay. And you know, he's been true to his word. I love him, I adore him. Because he's teachable, I'm teachable. I always represent this as his company, but I do all the stuff he doesn't want to do, and he does all the stuff I can't do. So I have positioned him to just do the things that only you can do. He raises money, he works on new, new products, he, 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 and he's, I talk to him every day. I talk to him on my way in today. I call him the unicorn herder because he just sprinkles powdered sugar on everything and people give him money. That's a gift. I need that. He can't fire anyone to save his life. He's like, please fire this person for me. Please, 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 please. I'm like, okay, but you need to learn how to do this. It's worked great. And the board was stunned because they're like, how has she gotten him to be this guy? He was always this guy. He just had a hard time with things that you have to do when you grow up as a company. And I'm good at that because I know how to get things done. I'm that guy who gets things done. But he has taught me how to raise money. So together we've raised quite a bit of money together. And we had, been, we had um, some investors who came in last week. And we just sat down and we finished each other's sentences. And they were so entertained by us. They're like, we've never seen anything like this with kind of like this Sonny and Cher thing. Of course, he didn't understand that because he's 35. He's like, is that a good thing? I'm like, I'm tall and thin. It's all good. <laughs> so they want to give us some money. That's because he's so great. He's so great. More questions? Really, anything. Yes, sir. He has like one job. Hey, there we go. Uh, we primarily recruit from BYU, okay. and we have never been able once to uh, to hire a female technical employee. Uh, do you have any tips or, or anything that we can do to, uh, to be more inclusive in our recruiting practices? So good for you for really trying to improve the diversity in your company. The reason that everyone needs to pay attention to diversity is because your company should look like your customers look, right? If you don't have women in your organization, your teams are not going to be able to develop great products. And we're in education. You should have all women in yeah. your company. <laughs> right. So you need, and people will pay attention to that. So I had, I met with Enterprise Rent a Car last week. Do you know Enterprise is a 19 billion dollar privately held family company, run by a woman. She's tough. And so my chairman's like, you have to come because we can't show up without you. I'm like, okay. Um, unfortunately, women are not applying for computer science engineering degrees like they were in 1970. So the numbers are down. And part of it's because there's not a tribe for women in computer science and engineering. They don't see themselves. They don't see other models. They don't see other people. And they have demands. And they know that they can make good money doing other things. So one of the rings, and do you guys know this guy right here? Raise your hand. He's my partner in crime because um, I, he, he and I worked together years ago with, I'm like, but there's not enough women in the program. It's going to hurt the university. You've got to be prescriptive about it. So we find the same thing. One of the things you need to pay attention to is that women typically will underestimate and underrepresent their skills on a resume. Whereas men will typically, not always, overrepresent their skills on a resume. It's just, it's just the way it is. Not caring. This is, I actually have data for this. The other thing is that Women will only apply for jobs that they're absolutely qualified for, typically. Where men will be like, yeah, I totally can do that. Yeah, I had a paper route. I can totally do that, right? <laughs> so if your process is to just look at your resumes, you're already at a disadvantage. So I told my guys, every resume that you get for a woman, I want you to bring her in. She may not be qualified on paper, but why don't we check? And so my sales team is like, you know, these women are really qualified. They didn't, their resumes are terrible. It's not that their resumes are terrible, it's just that as a culture, this is what we do. So since you know that, you have to go out of your way. I will not hire for gender. I got a nasty email from one of my employees yesterday because we just hired a, a, a vice president to come in to run tech support. 
who ran it before, I might add, who, if you pair him with all the candidates, was perfect. But they said, we can't believe you hired another man. I was like, I hired another man? I hired another executive, who's great, by the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm explaining this to her. I won't hire by, for gender. I won't, if you're not as qualified, I won't consider you. But I have gone out of my way. I still go out of my way. I made calls to female engineers that I knew to come and work for us. They can get top dollar because there aren't enough of them. It's all supply and demand. So I grow a lot of them. That's why I have 30 interns. I'll probably have 40 by the end of the summer because I bring in young people and we grow them. We grow our own data scientists. We grow our own analytics team because I can't get enough of them. So start with some schools, get some interns in there. And then when you find smart, capable people like Zonda, like Jess, bring them in. Even if they don't have all the pedigree that you need, smart, capable people will learn. And I love Liz Wiseman's book about rookie smarts because learning is better than knowing all the time. Okay, what else? We're almost out of time. You repeat that. It's called Rookie Smarts by Liz Wiseman. And the reason I love this book is because now I'm old, right? And when I was sick, Liz came to visit me all the time. She actually wrote the Multipliers and Diminishers book, another great book. A little heady, it's, you, gotta, you gotta pay attention. But it, it, you, the question you ask is, am I a multiplier of people? Do I make my team smarter or am I a diminisher? Guess what, we all do both. We diminish, there are behaviors that we do that diminish other people's ability because we enable them to do things we don't need them to do. But what I love working smart is when I was um, considering taking the job as a CEO. I've never been a CEO before, but you know, like how hard can it be, right? There's a lot of people that do it. So um, when Spencer and the team said, uh, have you always wanted to be a CEO? I'm like, no, not really, truly. When I took the job, Liz was like, what I love about you is that it doesn't matter that you haven't done it before because you're a rookie at heart. What I did is I found people who had done it before. I found what Adam could do, which was raise money. Adam, teach me. I found other people. I went and I made mistakes, but guess what? I was self-healing and I failed fast and I could learn and just adapt. And I had great skills, but I also knew there were things I didn't know. And so that's what it means to be a rookie. In that book, I'm a firewalker. I go from safe cold stone to safe cold stone, but I just keep moving. And that's why the law of good enough resonates with me because yeah, good enough, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. But it's a great, easy book to read. Well, you talk about hiring smart sensors. Here, Trevor. We can share my mic too, Trevor. <laughs> Get close. Just you talk about time. hiring smart, sensible people. We're finding smart, sensible people, but they're also getting younger. Do you see a line, or how do you feel about, okay, they're smart, but they might be younger? I don't care how old people are. Well, I got Adam, like he, he doesn't know who Sonny and Cher are, right? <laughs> I typically hire for fit. And if I see something in someone that I know I can develop, they lack confidence or they lack, I'll bring them in and I'll take them on. So they are getting younger. Guess what, thank goodness, because we have, the American economy, we have a struggle ahead of us, and we need smart, bright, capable people who are not afraid. I'm on this uh, panel in a couple weeks, this workforce, global workforce, Catherine, what a global workforce dilemma thing. Yeah, one of the questions is, uh, how do you deal with millennials? Aren't they brats? And I was like, no, they're lovely. Yeah. Right, they bring their own equipment to work. I don't have to buy them equipment. They don't have to have an office. Work is where they are. They just work all the time. And they raise their hand, they're like, yeah, I don't get this. Or yeah, this is a bad idea, right? And so the, the, um, some of the leadership that I have, that I work with in my company, not, that's kind of outside the company, my board type, they're much more structured and you gotta be in it a long time. And so they're gonna miss out because I'm not afraid to hire young, capable people. That's why I have so many interns. And my interns are not beast of burden interns. They don't, they don't make photocopies and make files and stuff. No, they, we say to them, look, we're thinking of a new social program, go. We're thinking of changing our building. What should it look like? We're thinking, and they're just like, ah. Oh. We're like, yeah, we're not, we're gonna give a safety net, but just go. And some of our best work has come from people that make $12 an hour. So I, tell, I, talk, to, I talk to Aaron Sconner from Pluralsight, I talk to all the CEOs, guys, you're missing out because we have, 90,000 students within like 30 miles, BYU, UVU, University of Utah, Westminster, Newmont. I mean, we've got all this, all this great firepower here. We should do more with it. And as we give, as we give these kids opportunity early on, not be a burden job, the fabric of our community is better.
because I tell the young people, don't work with food unless you want to be a chef. Work harder to get a job where you're working with customers, where you're selling, where you're having to do, enterprise rent a car, you're on the front line having to deal with customers because those skills will transfer and you will learn a ton of things. Thank you so much for the Thank time you. today. Appreciate Thank you. It.